We just read Brandon Sanderson's first published novel, the book Elantris. Welcome to Next Chapter. I'm Marty, and this is Jaden, and we're here to review the book. Let's talk about it. Okay, Jaden, so uh, let's start off from the very beginning of this book. Um, it is uh, jumps right straight into the action with Rayadon waking up, and uh, that sounds like a dinosaur. Is that? Am I saying his name right? <laughs> I think is so. Is it Rayadon? Rayadon. <laughs> okay, so he wakes up and he Rayadon. becomes... Rayadon. Rayadon. It's Rayadon, isn't Rayadon. it? Rayadon. Yeah, yeah, Rayadon. I think, I think it's an E. Yeah, I think it's The problem Rayadon. is we listen to all the books that we read, so sometimes like when I, when I try to see it, see the name... <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of names, though, this book, even right from the beginning, you have the religions, the cities, the people's names, that they are wild. Yeah, this one was kind of hard to keep the name straight. It was incredibly you hard. You have, like, all the crazy names, like Shudirith, like, Shukoroth. Like, which are different things. Which are different things. <laughs> Polar opposites. And if you're listening to it quickly or just, like, kind of reading through it, like, it'll look like the same or it'll sound the same. Yeah. It kind of made the book a little tricky at times. It because was tricky of that. because you just don't recognize any of the names, and you have to try and remember them. And you're like, "Was that a city? Was that a person? I'm not quite sure." Yep. The one thing with names, before we get into it, that really was crazy for me is I had a, my first boss in my consult my consulting days. You know, this is years ago now. My first one of my first managers back name when was you were Srini. a young whippersnapper. Yeah, back <laughs> when I was young, his name was Serini. Yeah, and the people would say it's Serini. No way. And. He, Let's let's just say that it, it toiled, it spoiled the experience of part of the book for me. Really? I was like, it just, it was, it was it was odd. It was a little off putting because like it's a super uncommon name. So yeah, if you know, I guess it's a little bit more common in other cultures. I don't know, but it was one of those things where I was like, oh, yep, I know that name. What did he say? He even had a friend that he he based the name off. Yeah, but it was named Serena. It was named like uh, it was something close. No, it was like Ashley or something. Oh, like that. Oh, well, that's not even sort I'm of pretty close. sure it was. Yeah, yeah. It was far <laughs> enough remember. away that. It was interesting. Oh, it's based. The character's based off some of the name was. But his name was straight up Serini or Serini. Was it Serini? His name was S R I N I Serini. Wow. It was said pronounced Serini. the same way. Yeah. Wow. Pretty crazy, that huh? is pretty. Uh, yeah. So it was like all, I was constantly drawn back. So I was like, oh wait, that's this is a girl and a princess, like completely different. So <laughs> it was kind of funny. Like the names were so wild. I think the intention was there was like. These are not names that anybody uses, but surprisingly enough, <laughs> you had one. I, I have no someone with that name. So. Well, yeah, the names were kind of all over the place. I think he, I kind of feel like fantasy writers have a lot of pressure to make names that they feel like are just super out there and super different. Do you think it's because it was his first book that he was succumb to that pressure? I think Sanderson gets a rap for having like crazy names, like no matter what his books are. Like I've, I, I've I read think that. It's to- <laughs> it has toned down quite it a is, lot. That's though. what I was gonna say though. I think it has toned down yeah. quite a bit from Elantris. I mean, Kaladin versus, I don't know, Aventio. <laughs> yeah. like it's a little bit uh a little different yeah they're just kind of a mouthful and they're yeah. kind of hard to keep straight because of that even like Hraith, Hraithen and Hraithen. Diloph for yeah. some reason I was like getting the two of those characters mixed up on oh. who was who who I, I knew in my mind's eye like who was who but like getting the names of, of the two of them I'm like okay okay there's Hraithen and there's Diloph definitely okay, and both. this is one of those things where you're just like if you're not paying attention, sometimes it helps me because the audiobook readers use different voices. And I'm like, sometimes if I miss who is speaking, I'm like, okay, I know that voice. I know who this is. Yes. We're fine. Yep. <laughs> but if you miss that, if you're reading, I feel like you could get very confused. Which is a good place to kind of jump into it is what did you think about this audiobook reader? I thought the audiobook reader did a good job. Really? Yep. I it also hated this audiobook reader. It was, I would say, I would rank it definitely lower than Warbreaker for me. And Warbreaker is already lower than like... Kate Reading and uh, Michael Kramer. So it's like yeah. on the scale, it's on the lower end, the lowest so far for Sanderson novels. But it wasn't it wasn't terrible that I couldn't get through the book. Yeah, I will say so. I will not give away the name because we will let all of y'all guess what our next book is going to be. But Kate Reading is re- reading part of this book, and so is Michael Ooh, Kramer. So it's a clue. Yes. Put in the comments. Pause the video. Put in the comments what you think our next book is going to be. It's probably going to come out a week from now, but. We're curious to see if you guys can guess what we're reading next. Yes. And once I got, once I got into that book and I started hearing them read again, I'm like, these guys are just next level. That's like they are different. so good. It is just, it's refreshing to the soul. <laughs> to be able to hear them again, you're like, wow, these guys just know how to read a book. Like other when you're reading Elantris, it just, to me, it, I struggle with it. I feel like he made the characters more annoying than they needed to be. 
And again, I said this with Warbreaker, with this book, I could not tell if I wasn't enjoying this book as much because of the reader and the reader was ruining the experience or if it was because it's Sanderson's very first published novel. Very interesting. It's, I think you're letting slip some of your eventual review. At the very end of the video, there will be a final review. Mm -hmm. We'll give our decimal point out of 10. Uh, and I, I, I think I'm starting to get hints of what yours might be. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, I, you may not, though. But we'll as far see, we'll as the see. audiobook reader, I think there were some characters that, that did bother me. And even before the podcast, we try our very best not to discuss too much about the books before the podcast. But one of the things I think I mentioned to you was the fact that Galadon specifically was annoying to me. Oh, yeah. Where his, his, his dialogue just did not connect quite right. Was and it the way is, it was written or the I way think, that he was read? I think it's the way that it was written, but it probably could have been redeemed a little bit more by the way it was read, and yeah. it wasn't. One of the things was like, he uses slang a lot. Things like, oh, Suli, you know, all that stuff where he's calling him the names and things of, of his doula culture. But then he would also say like just crazy words that you just wouldn't expect to come out of someone who's like using slang but also saying complex words like uh, i'm trying to remember he even he even mentions it um rayodin even mentions like how did you learn that word um, oh yeah you know what i'm talking about yeah, yeah i know what you're talking about so, yeah he would use complex words complex vocab but also be like all slang like, it's just it feels odd in the same sentence that's all i'm saying yeah 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 he he comes off i don't know he, he didn't annoy me as much really as the as keine did his voice Huh. Like the uncle of Sereni. Yeah. Because like he, she, he just comes in and she, he just comes off as so annoying to me. And like <laughs> his voice and everything. And I'm like, he seems like a cool guy and a cool character and everything. But just the way that he's read is kind of annoying. The king's voice, I can't even handle. Every <laughs> single time the king talks. Which what, king? Yeah, it's the, what, a, it's not Eventio. It's the, um, it's Raiden's dad. Oh, man. Raiden's dad is Iodon, right? Iodon. A yes. Iodon? Iodon. Yeah, 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 Iodon. Every single time Iodon spoke, I was like, okay, this voice, he just sounds like incompetent. Although <laughs> I think the book was trying to go for that, but I think Sanderson overplayed his hand in the writing of the King Iodon. Hmm. The, just, he makes the king way too stupid in the book, and there's, he makes a lot of his characters way too dumb. Whereas you read some of his later books, like Sanderson, again, does a lot less of like telling you about the character and really letting you experience why he's a bad king instead of just saying, oh, yeah, he's over there trying to make slaves out of these people. He shows you being kind of heartless and ruthless yeah. and, and making slaves out of his people. And like there's a difference between those two. There's a reason why you hate uh, Ellen Venture's father, like because he's yeah. just like an absolute tyrant. And then with this book, you kind of just like, kind of like, oh yeah, he's kind of a dumb king, makes dumb decisions, not very smart, and he's just greedy. Like that's all I get from. from you get that, but he king also Iron. mentions, and you have to kind of have in the back of your mind that he's the one that wrestled to power when Solantris fell. Yes, and you're so supposed you have to be like he he has to be at least capable enough to have taken power. Yes, but you don't even get that sense, in my opinion, from like the book. Like he I don't think he wrote wrote that in well enough. Like, oh like you just as like I said, you're just assuming he's really dumb and really stupid. Yeah, and a lot really of the great. interactions with Sereni too for the king were were a little tricky because they're just like he's the king. Like you yeah. can't you can't let that just happen. But I wonder if there was some like behind the scenes stuff that could have been added. And I think in my mind, I almost did add a little bit of backstory to like, he's just really busy and stressed and like he's trying to figure everything out. Everything's falling apart in different areas. So it's, it's harder for him to deal with like the here and now moment. Like this lady's yelling at him. It's easier to just be like, do whatever you want, go away. I'm dealing with stuff right now. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's kind of where my mind went, but I totally see that there are gaps <laughs> in his <laughs> character. Yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to jump back, though, to the beginning of the story where we'd okay. started. Yep. Um, we're back. <laughs> we're back. We're back. But I thought it was really interesting to have the story start by throwing you straight into the action yeah. with uh, Rayadin, right? Rayadin? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Rayadon. Rayadon. I keep thinking every single time. Rayadin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rayadin, he becomes an Elantrian right away, yep. and you learn about that. What did you think about the whole Elantrian experience of like what it's like to become an Elantrian, and what, did, what are your thoughts on that? I really liked it. Yeah. I really did. I thought it was such a cool description of things, and I think he does a good job of letting you experience it, because you don't 
he doesn't just say and this and that and the other thing it's it's he goes into the city he doesn't know what's going to happen he stubs his toe and then realizes you're going to have this pain for the rest of forever not yeah. just the rest of your life like forever like all those little things you're like you are almost as ignorant to it as Raiden is and you're like I don't know what's going to happen what's going on like he makes the he makes the connection with Galadon and it's like all these things where it could go horribly wrong at any moment you kind of feel that I yeah. thought it was great oh yeah and it's crazy because those moments too you kind of realize like how incomprehensible it would be to have that much pain for so long yeah. like even when you stub your toe or imagine like stepping on a Lego and having that feeling <laughs> forever <laughs> it'd be awful man Total. like it'd be awful I, it's just, uh, it, it is kind of a, a crazy concept to think about. So I It like was. I think the society, though, I think was built well. And that's one of the things where even though it was Brandon Sanderson's first book, I definitely give him props for what would society descend into? What would chaos look like in a city where everyone stays alive forever? No one has any food, but they don't, like, all they want is food, but they don't need it to survive. It's this weird balance there but also like yeah the gangs the rival gangs like but there's some weird they just wait for people to take a step and then there's this person like can yeah, attack their agreements their that they've had yeah, these little agreements that go on and and how these different gangs rose to power i think that's cool and i think it, it was well described yeah i i thought it was a very fascinating idea too it's a clever way sanderson even said this in the postscript a little bit that he it's it's pretty much a zombie book like he, he says yeah he's like i wanted a zombie leper colony like, yeah. okay <laughs> like, okay like i guess that's a great way to describe it because yeah that's kind of what they are right pretty much yeah yeah so i i thought that was funny um especially because it kind of gives you like the post-apocalyptic feel especially because it started as a society that was just so great and such a cool concept, right? To imagine to have like a city of gods in your backyard that all of a sudden one day like collapses and they become the outcasts of the society. Yeah. Like the like like the scourge of the society. It's crazy. So and it's it's all encompassing. Both the people in the city are like, yeah, they're the worst, and the people inside of Elantris are like, yeah, we're we're dead. Like yep. that's it. We're dead. I feel like it changed. It basically changed immediately. Yep. And it's interesting to see how they reacted to that and, and all the people that have gotten so much pain that they just barely exist anymore. Yep. And and Galadon reminds you a million times that like you're dead, Suli. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like that's because that. you're that, dead. See that that part I think his voice was a little annoying. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's cause you're dead. Yeah, anyways. Um other parts that I really thought were interesting is uh throughout the book you have the whole conversations between Hraithan and Diloph. Ah, the religious zealots. Yes. The priests. I thought their story was super fascinating. So this is the second time that I've read this book. Okay. First time, it was fine. Second time, I enjoyed this book way more than the first Interesting. time. This okay. keeps happening with Sanderson it, books, which is awesome. It's a lot, like, yeah. Even with the ones that I like, I'm like, oh yeah, like it even more. Like, it's just, they're very well written. Um, but I love how one of the things that Sanderson did right is he makes Diloph horrifying. Like that yeah. character is like terrifying. And it's cool too, because you kind of see where he's going with this. He this is clearly like a, his rise of Hitler story. Like he's like, he's getting everyone, Diloph and, and Hraithan are like, yeah. we need to create a scapegoat. We need to create someone for everyone to hate. And it's going to turn our political society like to go where we needed to go. And yep. instead of like the Jewish people, he has the Elantrians as their scapegoat. It's just like just a ball of raging hate. Yes. Where you like can't see anything else. And he's the, he becomes this religious zealot for that reason. Right. That's interesting. All and the sacrifices along the way. Totally. And you see like even like the old like videos of like Hitler giving speeches. He's like fiery, like spitting and stuff like that. And like just like yelling. And, and you can see like, like, Diloph has to come straight from that because he's giving those yeah. same speeches throughout the, the passion, whole book. The passion, the crazy. Yeah. Yep, and he's getting people riled up about it and stuff. Like the whole time I'm reading this, is like this is horrifying. Like yeah. how like that can happen, and the way he does it makes sense, which is really cool too. Like it's not cool that like, <laughs> like that that happens that way, but like it's just interesting to see. Like oh yeah, I could see it makes logical sense. Yeah, how yeah. you could get a people to start getting like just starting to manipulate a people to start coming your direction to start manipulating a crowd but both of those people were doing it Harathan and uh Diloph, right yeah it's yeah. it and they go about it in completely different ways but i think Harathan is 
also very like conniving, especially for the first, you know, three quarters of the book. He's like, how do I make this work? Like, who do I put in the right place so that yep. everyone will serve me and like I'll be in charge, but I'll also get credit for converting this whole people to my religion. Yeah, like, he, he definitely feels like a corrupt priest because it just seems like he's doing everything for personal personal benefit, but I guess benefit of his religion. It seems it seems that way the whole time. Like he's he's not necessarily very devout. He's a little bit more. Uh, taking advantage of yeah taking advantage of the religion more than anything else yeah and the other thing I like too is the contrast between the two because they are both like followers of the religion like devout like I would say yeah Um, but Hraithin follows more of like a controlled manner and Diloth is more like out of control the example that comes to mind which I thought was crazy is I just love the psychology of like of riots I think I was reading in the Ender's Game series, like they kind of go into this a little bit too, on just how people can, like you can lose control of a crowd that you're riling up, even though you think that they're on your side and you're getting them riled up with hate and anger and stuff like that. If you get them too riled up, you're going to lose control and they can turn on you. They can, they're uncontrolled and so they're gonna start doing things that you don't want them to do. And so in the moment in the book where he's like, he says that they can hear the Elantrian and like, and everyone's getting super fired up about him. And Wraith is like, uh oh, like I've got to they're shut this, this down. Guy. Like they're gonna kill this guy. They're gonna go raid Elantras right now. And this is way before I need this to happen. So I, I thought that was just really, really interesting. It's an interesting concept because you think about like what it was the base consciousness. You think about like a mob mentality where no one's really thinking anything through. They're all just taking instinctive actions, and sometimes that can get crazy. Yeah, so very crazy, pretty wild. I'm curious before we go too deep into like the out- aftermath of the religious stuff, which is very interesting. Overall, like maybe kind of at the beginning, Serini's storyline, yeah, and her wedding and how that how that works with the contract. I think I want to talk about that a little bit. Okay, so first thing is that marriage contract we talked about is she has to go sight unseen. Basically, they've communicated through their sea owns, but sight unseen off to the new city to marry the prince. She kind of likes him already, but when she gets there, she finds out he has died. He has died, I guess. Yeah. How do you feel about the fact that like he writes in the cultural element of you're still married to him even though he's dead? Yeah. Like was that did it seem too convenient for the plot? Was it like, "Oh, that's just an interesting nuance to the culture?" I don't know. To me, I just kind of accepted it. I okay. I thought that was kind of a it makes sense politically to do something like that because then like it's not like a I don't know, because the whole idea is the treaty, right, and the pact between the two. And so yeah. if, like, one dies or the other, like, you don't want this whole thing just thrown off over, like, something like that. And so, I mean, that's exactly what happened in here. And so, like, we still need the treaty, and so we want it to continue. I, that makes sense. That's, that what, that's what I thought, but well, I don't know what you're thinking of it. I, I guess my first thought, and it, I did accept it, but I was thinking politically, like, what, what would make the most sense? And one of the things for me was, like, why, why would... I don't know, the father, I guess, does a good job of being against it. He's like, well, just come home. Like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And I think that makes the most sense to me where he, he's almost saying, like, you can't live your entire life, like, married but having never been married. Like, how would that serve? And this, this is the bigger part. How would that serve a monarchy to be guaranteed to not have any heirs? Like, that, that seems like that's the problem. Yeah. Like, how does, how does that work? At that point, I think she would be dismissed and then, like, uh, the king would probably take another another wife or something or try and have more heirs or something because the, the goal of most of these monarchies is to continue to have heirs to continue the dynasty of their reign with yeah. most kingdoms so i thought that part was a little bit weird like oh no it's fine we're just gonna have a a, a widow daughter-in-law that's just gonna kind of run the yeah, country just hang out around so here. it seemed odd but the king didn't even like her so i know it's a little bit all all odd but i kind of go along those lines though so sereni makes that decision and kind of like tells her father like like this is what i want to do this is one of the parts of the story that kind of bothered me oh. like i think it went a little bit too far into like the I don't know. It made Serini really smart and all the guys really dumb and then all the yeah. rest of the girls really dumb too. Like and I'm like, okay, like there's not another smart girl out there. Like like there's not and none of the she's the only political mastermind out there besides like Raithen and and She's the only one who can solve the Empire's Raiden. problems. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm just like it just kinda was a little bit like too much for me. Like I wish I this I kinda all leads to the point though that I feel like Sanderson like didn't do a very good job on Serini, but he did a great job on Yasna. 
I think that Yasna yeah. is the improved Serini. I think really? she is the same character, but he just did a better job. Interesting. And I think if she he had put Yasna in the situation, it would have been fascinating. Like, of course, you could have like had like a little bit more like changes and stuff to make her more of who Serini is. But I I really do think that like Yasna is the improved version of Serini. Interesting. I I actually didn't have many qualms with the political stuff. Yeah. And the reason was is I I kind of assumed, again another call to uh, the the princes or rulers of other Cosmere places, but they just didn't care. It's not that they're just too politically dumb. But like when she gets the merchants together, most of them are like, do whatever you want. Like, yeah, it really doesn't matter to me. Like I'm doing my thing because the whole government was built on who has the most money. So they're like, who really cares about the like overall structure of the bureaucracy? All I care about is my stuff. And that's why you had people really worried about their shipments of sour melons and all the different things. It's like, that's what that's the only thing that matters in this game right now. Yeah, that's how political stuff goes. And she was the only one who was going into this saying, like, I care about this entire kingdom and the unity of the kingdom. Where nobody else really did. Yeah. I just feel like everyone else was uh, was fine to be like, let the king do whatever the heck he wants. Like he never messes with us. Like we live in this city, but I don't think they were a cohesive group. Yeah. And well, except culture. for that that group that got together and they were trying to overthrow Iodon. The the secret meeting group of uh, nobles. Are we are we jumping forward a little bit? Well, to, well, you were just talking about many, like there's a couple of secret meetings, I guess. Well, it's <laughs> just like from the very beginning, she's yeah. like it gets into that meeting that uh, she Raiden calls started. The uh, Raiden had started this meeting before that she had even gotten there. Okay, because remember he was running the meetings, and then like she decided that she's going to show up because Kei invites her. Ah, because I remember one of the ones that they just didn't want to show up because she's like, I've been trying to get these people together for so long, and they just didn't want to show up to join in the conversation because of because of her mostly yeah because yeah i think a lot of it's apathy raiden more than was just gone. incompetence yeah 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 because raid on raiden was gone i keep wanting to call him a dinosaur <laughs> it's so funny yeah but anyways i but i guess the last thing i want to say with the gasna thing too is because they tr- she he tries to come off and have like serenity as like this strong like like demanding woman like who like who's able to like get her way in a strong way but i just again i feel like yasna pulls that off way better because like she yeah. she's able to do it in a way that like it's just it doesn't come off as annoying it comes off as like she is strong she is commanding she is real like i don't know i guess that's the way like serini just like i feel like i, I saw serini yasna. that like, way i i would agree that she's not yasna but i still think she had a strong enough like, she was kind but she was also yeah. very forward with what she wanted to do and say it's true i'm probably just tainted because yes is one of my favorite characters in like <laughs> all of his true. books yeah. like i i think she's just great i think she, it just the plays exactly what he's looking for in this situation just better yeah but that anyway. oh, makes sense yeah and then i i think we spend a lot of the time in the middle section of the book in like rayodin's experience basically taking over elantris mm-hmm. which i would say is this the single coolest part of this book. I loved it. Yeah. I loved his methods of getting all of these groups together and figuring it all out and starting to take control little by little. Uh, his, I liked his leadership style. I thought it was cool that they really showed like the mistakes, but also the risks he was taking. Like, this is the only way we're going to get these people or we got to do this or that. And, like, he had people working with him. But also, I think overall, one of the concepts of the book that I liked is it talks about just the the raw power of the human mind, yeah. like the human like uh, whatever would be like motivations and determination, like how that can surpass anything. Like the pain that they felt, the hunger they felt was insane. But once he gave them a purpose, that started to melt away. And it's wild because you don't think of like, oh, a purpose is just something fun to do or a vision or like a meaning for your life. I think that is a powerful message and I really latched onto that and I thought it was really cool. Yeah. It's one of those things where you're like, people are like, oh, I just, I work super hard my entire life so that I could retire on a beach somewhere. But they don't recognize that like one of the most important things of life is the pursuit, like the journey, some might say, before Ooh. the destination. Wow. But some I, people may say that. <laughs> some people say that. I've heard it. <laughs> I've read it in comments. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, that's one of the elements, like a continued uh, a continued repetition through the Cosmere of like that focus, that drive, that uh, something that comes from inside of you is strong enough to overpower the circumstances that are given to you. 
And I think that was a big element of his leadership. Where it's like, I have the capability to lead these people. Therefore, it's my responsibility. Yeah. And I loved the whole the whole thing. That is, one of the, seven, great. that is one of the things that I love about Sanderson books is like, again, when we always say, you're getting life lessons out you of are. these things. You are. You absolutely are. It is Leadership awesome. Leadership lessons. Leadership lessons. I know. And and he's a great example of a leader, right? And uh, I that's what I try to be is like optimistic and everything. Um, I do see it from uh, probably like what other people see from me is like from Galadon's perspective like okay dude you're like you're way too optimistic on literally everything like, calm down i'm like okay like <laughs> but like I, I don't know but it works out for him in the end right maybe that's just because sanderson wrote it that way but like, <laughs> no but i i think he, he has a great leadership style i like how he's trying to be have ingenuity i really like your point on just having like a, like a purpose in life and that's what gets people past the the hayoid 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 it's it's like hoid. It's really close to hoid. Which they make the a hoid, hoid joke at the end. The hoid, yeah. Hoid. 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 Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you say it really fast, then, then no one will know. know if you said it right. And, and listen to it on like four times speed too. So <laughs> Yeah, people listen to our videos on three X. I know, probably. There's or no one point five at least. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to my own videos on one point five when I re listen through this thing. So it's it's one of those things that you talk about the vision that he gave to people, like the the, the purpose. But what was cool to me about that, and again, my favorite part, so I'm going to talk about it for a little bit. <laughs> What's cool about that is it was different for every single person. Yeah. Like he didn't, he didn't go to it and say like, we're building a new, clean, new Elantris. You should love that. It was like, they just did not care. And one, like, the good example is like the, uh, the sculptor. Yep. Was a gang leader who was like, like he's not going to be convinced because he's like, oh, guess what? You know, you're still going to get the same amount of food, but you can work for me like that. It's not enticing. Yeah. But he's like, this is something that I know you are passionate about. Like, focus on that and focus on making that better and more improved and, and really dive into that. And he's like, yeah, like that can find purpose in someone. No one else in the community would have loved that as much as he did. But then there's also people that just have no capability. And you think about kind of the, the more, I guess, beast-like followers of some of the other gangs were just like so deprived of food, so much pain that they just couldn't even think. He had those people too. But the purpose he gave them was just to exist in as minimal pain as possible. Like He's like, I'm not going to put these guys to work. He didn't have them doing anything. He was just try to keep them in a position where they're not actively aggressive, which I think is an improvement. So he's trying to, with everything that he does, make everyone's life just a little bit better. And he deals with a lot of strain in the process. And he's making himself better. He's learning. He's going through his little library that he found, which is cool. Yep. Uh, speaking of library and like knowledge and stuff, which we're going to get into the power in a second. But did it? Maybe I missed a jump somewhere. <laughs> but the the fact that the whole power um, is called remind me if I'm saying this wrong it was like Aeondor. Aeondor. Yeah. But then like halfway through, he's like, "There's this word that keeps showing up. Door. Is that important?" And I'm like, "It's part of the name. <laughs> like, how are we missing this? Yeah. Like, that's half of it. The Aeons and the door. Like that's that's the word." <laughs> Yeah, but. I was so confused. I'm like that. That doesn't feel like a revelation at all. Yeah, like, I for me it felt like it was more like. So I don't think he knew what door was. I think it was a doula thing from like the mysteries, right? So the do like their whole like they believe in the mysteries, they worship the mysteries, and they believe that there's a power that like runs the world. Yeah, and then I think. Uh, Raiden connects that and says like, oh, like, wait a minute. Like, maybe they're, this is connected and the door is trying to be released. And like, maybe there's a thing. Yeah. That, okay. That does make some Galadin. So it's less explains. of like the wordplay. It's more of like what's actually going on. Because Gal- Galadin explains what the door is. But also this is Raiden. You know, you're doing it to me. <laughs> this is Raiden. <laughs> <laughs> but his power is that he's so intelligent. He's so like prepared he had studied he knew these things he knew the aeons before he came into the like this library he had studied that as as a prince but like he never never looked at that word and he never said door is part of a and door <laughs> that makes like there's a reason to look at that again i don't know to me that was just like you, i don't know it yeah. felt weird that it took him so long to figure that out okay so i want to go into like what you thought about like the magic system power yeah yeah, yeah. and for but before I get there, because I don't want to forget this, what did you think about the the whole thing of Seons? The 
the little talking like balls of light that were floating around. Like I thought it was very convenient and really not, not well explained. Really, I, I I didn't I didn't get that connection even all the way to the end of the book. I was like, where did they come from? Like, why are they? He yeah. he explains kind of their their mannerisms and characteristics. Like, they get their all of their benefit of life of serving and being bond bonded to someone. But yeah, where do they come from? I don't think we learned much about that. I had a theory because uh, your each Sion has like a symbol inside of it that like represents like a word or something like that. Okay. It sounds a lot like Spren, mm. and so I wonder if it's kind of like the same kind of deal. Is that these are like things that are manifested in the real world from like the uh, cognitive world, or even yeah. honestly though, I kind of feel like these are from the spiritual realm. Like there's like there's the three right. There's like the cognitive, spiritual, and physical realm. I wouldn't be surprised if we found out this is from the spiritual realm. I feel like I heard that from somewhere. Cannot remember why. It might but, like, have to be if it's because think about the uh, the communication. Yeah, the instantaneous communication. Instant communication. Yeah. Yeah, but those things are very interesting. They will come up in the uh, Stormlight Archive oh. at some point. So, and I think they've popped up in a book. <gasps> they popped up in The Lost Metal as well. There's a, I, we will not give any spoilers for The Lost Metal, but she... Spoiler for me right after the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's a way that they communicate with someone and you see just their head and like he's like, he can't really see you or anything that's going on around you. He can just see like you. And like they're definitely communicating That's got to be the same thing. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so, so they're yeah. relevant. They're definitely relevant. We'll see him again. Okay. Yeah. And he's like, got one, and Hraithan's got one trapped in a box, which I'm not sure how I feel about that. A box in a box. Yeah, I'm pretty That's sure nice, right? Hoyt does that in, in the Stormlight Archive as well. Oh. But, but see, but if Hoyt does it, like, does it make it, is it a good, does it mean that it's not, not bad? Not necessarily. Like, I, I know. <laughs> I don't put it past that guy to make bad choices. I know, but I'm like, that should, I don't know, because they said, like, uh, Raiden is like all concerned he's like hey are they like slaves like like I'm so sad like like you're just like gonna serve me forever and you're like go free go free he's like I'm, I want to serve you but if you're stuck in a box does it make things a little bit different <laughs> it's gotta like, make it different I don't know I'm like who gave him the Sion like was, was it intentional yeah was it a forced thing oh, man and do you wonder if I wonder so he's gonna be writing two more Elantris books ah uh, that I was gonna ask about because I'm curious how he's gonna continue this story yeah so he's gonna write the next three Mistborn books and he's gonna relate, release two um, Elantris books so I'll go Mistborn Elantris Mistborn Elantris Mistborn oh yeah so he'll have a lot better writing style and like skills and all sorts of stuff by then but I hope that we get a perspective from a Sion. Like, I want to know, like, that would be interesting. how interesting would that be? Because I want to know if they're living, because like, they can communicate with all the other Sions at the same time. Can they see through all other Sions at the same time, too? And mm -hmm. so, like, being stuck in one place wouldn't really matter because you can live your life through other Sions, too. Besides the point that you can't really move or leave that spot. But, like, I don't know. It's just kind of like a really interesting, like, concept, like how those all work. But. And is it like an intentional conscious communication or can the conscious Sion's communicate with the mad ones? Oh, interesting. Yeah, that would be really cool too because the whole time they're talking about, Hraithan mentions, he's like, I don't really know what I can say to these Sion's that like what's going to be kept secret because I'm sure these things all talk to each other. And it's I'm like, do yeah. they instantaneously know what every other one is talking about? And like, maybe they have some sort of code like the Condra did on like things that they can or can't do. And ah, they, it's that's a, an interesting, I, I have not, I've not gone so deep in the sea owns yeah. for sure. I don't know. For some reason, I really latched onto that. And I was thinking <laughs> about it. I'm like, these are just fascinating. Like <laughs> I kind of let it go. I was like, that's very convenient. <laughs> they have these little, it's like a, little cell phones that float in the air. <laughs> yeah. To protect them from stuff. Like that's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but anyways we can go back to the the magic system so what did you think about the magic system that they've got overall i think this is one of my favorite magic systems really yeah. wow wow even better than like uh stormlight archive stuff uh, one of my favorite okay but i i'll talk about the reasons for it I think we may we, have to do a video on this i think we should i think yeah. we should do a video on all the different magic systems of the cosmere and what we think about them maybe even rank them so I think that would be the reason that I have this in my kind of higher list is because of what it takes to become skilled at it. Uh -huh. Like you can have the natural ability to by being an Elantrian, but that's almost random, at least as far as Hoyt is concerned. Yeah. Uh, it's basically random who gets taken. Well, I got to pause you right there. 
So Hoy doesn't get it at the end of this book. Do you remember when he does get it? There's a book that we just read recently. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't want to spoil anything else, but like it is very interesting. Let's talk about this. After. Yeah, yeah. I There's a know. very there are lots of Elantris connections to the other. That's books. well, we've okay. talked about this before. You're yeah, like, yeah. oh, when you read Elantris, <laughs> yeah. you'll get it. And there are so many that I don't remember them anymore. <laughs> I know. Now I've read it, and I I missed all those connections I could have had. Yeah. When were, when was I supposed to read Elantris? If you were taking a perfect order, when should I have read this? Um, I would say you you did, Kate. You would probably have to read it first because you wrote it first. But like, I don't think you're gonna miss anything from Mistborn Era One. If you were to read Mistborn Era One, you could read Elantris afterwards. Maybe you should probably I, that's read it before. probably right after okay. there. But honestly, I don't give it to people right then because I think it does s- slow you down. Like, if you don't yeah. jump from Mistborn to Way of Kings and you read Elantris next, you're like, that was a pretty good book. And then like, you like don't jump into this other stuff because it was only okay compared to Mistborn. Ah, interesting. So I don't know. But the magic system. Would you give it to someone for their first read? Yeah. You think that they would get him into Sanderson enough? Wow. Yeah. Okay. That that is a bit of a spoiler for my final. No, no, review. but that is. We a, will get there. But I was yet. very curious on that. Like, yes, I would. Okay. Yep. Do you want to expl- elaborate on that, or do you want to save? I, it for the I end? want to save it. <laughs> I, want to, I do have stuff to say about it, but let's save it till our final review. Which okay. Is coming okay. I'll up let very you save soon. it very soon. I'll let you save. It. Okay. So let's jump into the magic magic system. Okay. So I think the reason it's so cool to me is because it takes a certain level of intelligence and intention and precision. It's like. It's something you have to study. It's like you sit down and read about it. You learn the AO. It's like the, the more knowledge you have, I almost reckon it back to like a magic system similar to Harry Potter. Yeah. It's like the more, okay. the more spells a- you know, the more you learn about it, the more you practice and you figure it out, like the more powerful you become. And it also becomes how creative are you? It's like a- after you know the different uh, AODs or whatever you can draw, like then you can start to add these modifiers here, change this little thing here, add this little tweak to it, and you can do different things. Like he can heal a leg versus an arm versus a finger by adding these modifiers. It's like the more intentional and effort and study you put into it, the better you get at it. And maybe I'm remembering Harry Potter wrong, but like <laughs> like you, uh, they don't have like you can't just figure things out like that in Harry Potter, right? Like it's it's a little bit more like like the um, Elantrian system is a little bit more of a hard magic system, I'd say, because, like, you can just, like, write stuff. But Harry Potter, like, you have to just know, like, the words, right? But you can you can make up words, though. That's the thing. There are some spells that they just it's discover. A it's a, been a while since Yeah, I've so they, they discover spells, and they create spells by, I guess, just making up random Latin words. Yeah. Well, I would, <laughs> it is funny that you mentioned that, because I, I wrote down something very similar. This magic system feels a lot softer than all of the rest of his books. Like, it feels like... There's a little bit of the problem that I had with it. Okay. Is that it It just, I don't understand the limits of this magic system. It kind of feels like Harry Potter where you can just do anything. As, as long as you know what the words are and everything, like you have no bounds, which makes it feel super overpowered to me. Yeah. You know, like I feel like there's, you can just do anything. And as long as you know it, like, well, they're undefeated, like undefeatable. But I, some people like that kind of thing. This was fine. Like it's fun to like kind of see Sanderson do that take. I'm a much bigger fan of like I've got this much stormlight left, or I've got like it uses this energy from my body to do this specific task, and like I don't know. I just, interesting. It's interesting. I, that was actually one of the things that I liked about it, and I mentioned the fact that it was like um, how much you could do with it depended on the knowledge that you had. Yeah, and the proximity you had to Elantris. They mentioned that specifically, where he like he transports to another city, but then now that he's far away, he can only transport himself max fifty feet. Yeah. So they do have a little element of like your limit. You like you went as far as you could, and you went fifty feet. Yeah. You're discovering these limits. True. Limits definitely exist, but they're discovering them as they get through this. But I do think that allows for mastery to be like something you achieve over a significant period of time. It's not, to, and the, the difficulty for me with other magic systems of Brandon Sanderson is I'm the hero of the story. So magically, I'm 10 times more powerful than all these other people. Like, sometimes, like, it does not do that get, in his books. Sometimes Wait, it does. Give me an example. That is the reason why I do not, I Vin, love about his book. Vin is a great example. Okay. She's just inherently more powerful than a lot of other people. And she's just like, Kelsey, wow, she's just doing this so easy, so fast, it's so natural to, to me. Her. It was not she's that just she was born more with the skill. I to me that it was not that she was more powerful. It was just that she was more talented. 
It's the same thing. It is completely <laughs> different. Okay? No, okay. Like, it, like it, you could say like there's someone who is like like it's it's strength versus like ability, right? Like like you can do something, but like if you're not like if you're super strong at like wielding an axe, but you don't know how to use the axe, like it's not you're not going to be good at it. But if you're really skilled with the axe but not super strong, like it takes both to like be really good at it. I don't know. Vin was not as stronger than every single person that she met. She wasn't stronger than everyone, but she she hit those strength levels significantly easier than others. You have to say I, that. I true. disagree. I I think that she was just more talented. I I think that's that exactly what I'm saying. It's, it's the there prodigy. is a difference. I'm gonna call it the prodigy trope. That's what I'm gonna call it. There you you look at sports. This happens all the time in sports. Where there you are say, prodigies in sports. There are there are people who like they don't even try and they're really really good at the sport. But like, imagine if they tried and they like it, like were naturally really good. Like then they'd be incredible. Like you know, yeah. I think there's a there's a difference between the two. It's and just when when that happens to be the hero of the story, just happens to have the prodigy trope, prodigy skill set. It's just I don't know. The I don't think I don't think I don't well, have anything I, against Miss Porn. I love Miss Porn. Okay, just a second. I we need to talk about this. We'll have a, we're gonna make a whole video. <laughs> I know. On this. I know we're gonna make a whole video. <laughs> it's on because this. so Vin like she she's not str- she the the way that this happens is not because she's stronger than everyone else. That's not why the whole thing is resolved. It's because of the way things are schemed and the way that things are planned and the way that the plans are rolled out. There are lots of different people involved in the plans. And in fact, the only reason like you could say that she is stronger in certain situations is because like her whole connection with preservation helping her out. It's not her. I I can see the connection yeah, yeah. preservation being a big deal. Because I'm thinking about a very specific scene. I know, scene. me too. I'm thinking about <laughs> I'm actually thinking about a few specific scenes. But okay. I so maybe I opened a can of worms with the comparison. No. <laughs> but the reason that I say that is because I want to exp- want to convey the fact that it wasn't necessarily a like natural athletic ability comparison to be skilled at it. It's more time and devotion and intelligence. Like that I think yeah. was cool. But Where, it like, wasn't the power all comes that. from that and precision yeah. instead of just you know how naturally i will point out that raiden was more powerful than everyone else and he worked at it every single day for hours yeah but also every single day but galad was working galadon straight up says in the story that there are some people who were more powerful with andor than other people were and they said he's like i don't know why maybe they the andor liked them more than other people or something like that like so there was like some there's sort of like of that. There's, there's an, an element, element of it. But I, 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 I'll step back though. I see what you're saying that like it is more about like the um, intellect that gets Study you there. Study versus practice. Which I think that the Emperor's Soul, which is on the same planet, I think I actually like the way that's executed a little bit better. I loved that one too. Yeah, it was so good. For similar reasons. Is it? Oh, all the effort that it took to like go into like the, the, the concept of a forger was just like this super high level brilliant person who like really had all these connections and all the study that went into making it perfect i thought that was awesome oh yeah i think that was great too and isn't it interesting the connection between the two um uh, just like stamps and then and they're also, on the same world yeah they have, they have stamps and or like they're just like they're writing things or putting things on things it, it makes sense that they're mm-hmm. on the same planet but they're behaving in certain ways you're just looking up what what the uh the shard of the world was is dominion and devotion. devotion. Yeah, is it both dominion yeah, and both. devotion? Because dominion, because they talk about specifically in the story how everything is connected to a location, and so it's got to be connected to like your dominion. Like, yeah, maybe but that's think about the the, all the there. religions and devotion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the power that the religions held was crazy. Yeah, and so. like that's Hraithan's whole thing is like, how devoted yeah. are you? Like. Speaking of, I don't know if you want to continue on the magic system a little bit, but I want to talk about the monks pretty soon. Yeah, let me know. What, what do you want to talk about? I want to go monks? into the monks because yep. this was one of the things that I thought, and I, I feel like most of the topics so far with the book, I've been like, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. The monks, I don't know. I was like, <laughs> I kind of felt like you had just watched like the Batman, Ra's al Ghul stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who are these guys? Yeah, we're like super religious monks, but we also happen to be ninjas. And we train in like this assassin's facility. You're just like, what is this? 
that. Well, I actually thought, okay. Wait, it was is, cool, but I also was just, that's so weird. I actually kind of liked it. I thought it was fascinating to have a whole religion that was built on strength and like being pretty much warriors. Like that's who these like people were. And so it made sense to me that they had these people who are just like the elite, like special ops. Like <laughs> they, but a lot of it, at least what we learned from Parathen is about like preaching and conversion and all this stuff. They're not, Hey, I want to convert you so I can send all your kids to this super assassins camp. Yeah. Well, just, that connection didn't make any sense to the me. The sense to me that... How do the kids get there? Well, I mean, he's walking around in armor all the time. And yeah. so the sense that I got is that they're a very, like, brutal, like, religion. Like, they, they believe in, like, we're going to have everyone be devoted to our religion at all costs. And that means that every single one of our priests are going to be part of the military. How, hey, was, how was the religion connected to the military part? I, how I did I miss that? Because he talks specifically in the conversion process. He's like, I have all of these, all of these nobles either converted or sympathizers. I'm like, okay, but none of them are thinking about military things. He's not trying to convince them to become these military people. Like, what what aspect of the religion were they converted to? Were there two parts of this religion? That's where I was like, he's converting this whole city, but he's not he's not sending them to train as these crazy assassin people like it just felt like there's this this two-sided religion that was weird in my mind yeah i I don't know i kind of just accepted it as like that's just part of like the the training part of like just like what was accepted is the because all the priests like went through like the military training it's probably just because like they want to be influencing the whole earth and or the whole planet i guess not earth um, and it doesn't really matter how they get there. They just want to make sure that, like, whether it's by force or whether it's by um, uh, convincing them to get there, like, it's just, uh, I don't know. I don't know why. I To me, like, that like was just an interesting way. I'm like, oh, it's interesting to have a religion that's based with military involved in as well. Like, yeah. to me, that was that's kind of what I just, it it was kind of just accepted at but face it, value. It didn't click very well for me. I mean, that, it was probably one of my bigger complaints. Like, that seemed odd and then immediately i was like raza wool what <laughs> it seems exactly the same like there's like this secret place where they have all the kids that grow up learning to be assassins yeah and then they send them out into the world you're just like i've seen that before where have <laughs> i seen that before <laughs> yeah anyway that's really funny what yeah. did you think about hoyd's appearance well i i actually before you go there i i want to talk oh. about that i i want to mention that the whole reveal with uh Diloph, and how Diloph was oh, actually... Oh, so good. Yeah, suit. That part was so actually good. pretty crazy. So good. It's like, apparently, he's actually been around for, like, a very long time, like 70 years. He's been playing you this whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it just made me, like, think back through the whole book. So, I guess I'll back up for a second. So, that big moment when Diloph talks with Horathen and says, yeah, I remember when you were a little boy training with us for the very first time and how you were afraid and you left and, like, yeah. I knew you were nothing. Then how crazy it is to think about Diloph's experience of seeing Horathen come to where he is and then you think back to the beginning of the story where Hraithan just meets Diloph and he's like this is like noob over here like I'll just have him like come and be my servant and like the whole time Diloph like was his superior and he knew what was going on it was undercover boss the whole time <laughs> <laughs> that's true really yeah. though like he was trying to see how he was doing but although there was a couple parts like looking back I'm like I don't know if I believe it as much because Diloph seemed so like shocked about things or so like like kind of frustrated yeah frustrated frustrated. or kind of dumb for being 70 years old and being in your religion for so long and i don't know there's just a few things because it almost seemed like he was trying to be conniving and like push against this and like if he was truly just trying to slip in undercover would he have been so like back and forth with okay well you'll send me off on this trip fine i'll take 30 people with me like that just feels more like a subordinate trying to get back at their yeah. boss. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was that part. And then the other part, too, that I thought was kind of like funny is just like he has um, – uh, Hraithan has his whole moment where he becomes an Elantrian through the yeah. poison and then comes back. And then Diloph is like, whoa. Like I, this just <laughs> blew me away. Like, am I, <laughs> like I guess you are like a uh, – um, A superior. A, a superior and stuff like that. And just like, I don't know, just like putting those things together – like didn't really make sense to me to think back on it, but like, yeah, I don't know. And th- I mean, you mentioned the poison, so I have to talk about Serini's experience in Elantria. Oh, Elantris. Elantria. Yeah, yeah, Elantria. I almost said Elantrian, and then I anyway. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the reason is like, why were people not more suspicious? Like the whole time you're like, it's 
the, uh, <laughs> I know. it's the other vial of poison. He had one left, and like, well, nobody knew about the vials of poison. We did. Well, well, I know that, but like, like, well, we, I think we were supposed to know that in the book. We like, were supposed to know, but I think sometimes when you already know a secret, yeah, it makes more sense if other people are a little bit more critical. Yeah, because you just, you just, I don't know, you feel a little bit more like. Yep, this person's right. Instead of everyone just being like, "Yeah, totally weird that uh, she didn't have all this stuff happen, and her CEO's not crazy, and her CEO's not, not crazy. She she's doesn't have cold. pain. <laughs> like, 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 ah, that's wild, <laughs> crazy, whatever. <laughs> yeah, seriously, I think they would have been a lot more critical, especially Raiden. Well, I was stressed the whole time for her because of the whole experience with Raiden and saying like, "I'm gonna die of like thirst out here because they don't have any water in Elantris." Where'd she get her water? Like, is it just from, like, all the food she was able to be, eat, I guess? In the like, well? Yeah. In the middle of the city? What about the well in the middle of the city? They had a well. Oh, yeah, I forgot. They have a well <laughs> in the middle of the city. They get hit. Anyways, so, I don't know. I don't know. It's uh, There's a couple of those things. And you're right. The first book, I can understand where some of those things can slip through. But there were a couple instances where I was just like, wait a second. That doesn't click for me. Yeah, I know. I know. And I, like I said, I give him a pass. This is first. Uh, I, I, first I'm okay song. with that. Did yeah. you, so speaking of books, though, are you surprised to hear that it was never on a bestseller list? It was never on a bestseller list. He mentions that at the end. He said it sold 400 copies its first week. And he was like, that's terrible. That's awful. And his publisher's like, well, it's actually pretty good for a first novel for first time author. Just let it ride. And he said it's sold about 400 copies every week since for 10 years. Which is amazing. <laughs> He's like, it's never been on a bestseller list. It's never gone crazy viral. It's just, it's incredibly consistent. And yeah. that just, you know, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Which is cool. I was like, it surprised me that it was never on a bestseller list. But it was also like, wow, what a, what a cool story for an up and coming author to be like, you can be massively successful with just consistent small successes. Yeah. I, I, I think it makes sense um, to me. But I'll save that for uh, my review. review at the end. Okay. Do you have it's any more up. comments on it? I, I mean, want to talk about Hoyt's oh, yes, Hoyt. entrance. But that was it. And then we can then we can go straight into the review. A couple more minutes. Yes, yes. We're almost there. Okay. What did you think about his entrance slash his appearance in the book? Um, it was hilarious because when it, you hear Hoyt's name as a beggar, like a couple spots throughout the story. twice. Yeah. Like it's it's not very many. And the whole time you're like, is it Hoyd or is it just a beggar? Like, because you don't really get any signs. And I think Sanderson has talked about this and said he like wasn't sure if he was going to do the Hoyd thing. He was kind of nervous about it. It's and the best so thing he's done. It is <laughs> super awesome. Yeah, and having him all of his books. And so he did it like super lightly in this book just in case like people wouldn't like it. And yeah. then I think he even went back and rewrote that um, Hoyd entering the water part at the end of the book. The postscript? Yeah, he wrote that after the fact like years later. Just gotcha. to get Hoyt even more in and like more prominent, because otherwise he was just that random dude that's named Hoyt. That's good context, because I was yeah. like, that's so lame. Like, yeah, it's so light. I was constantly waiting for him to do some some funny thing. Yeah, he some just, story. Just like, accidentally <laughs> like yeah. move the plot along. You're like, oh, I'm just a beggar. It's no big deal. <laughs> yeah, he's gotten a lot more confident with his Cosmere connections. Yeah, I mean, and he knows that everybody loves Hoyt, so yeah. it's like it's fine. He knows he loves that, and even in the past, he said he's like, I'm ready to take the gloves off and like have a lot more. Cosmere it was it so. was into this book significantly before I knew that it was his first book. Really? Yeah. Why? I just never made that connection. Wow. wow. Did I forget to tell you that? Yeah. Wow. But it's okay. Well, I think it was even better because I, I didn't have that context. Well, did you realize that from the, like his, uh, the quality of his writing? Did you realize no. like, this must be his first book? <laughs> I, I, I do feel like there's been varying levels in different books we've read recently. Yeah. And especially the more recent ones compared to like the secret projects as an example. Yeah. So I think there's, there's little elements of that, but... I still think he was an excellent writer. I mean, I don't have that many qualms with, with the book. And knowing that it was his first book, I think probably would have made me more critical more than anything else. Would have made you more critical? Yeah. For me, it makes me less critical. I'm like, ah, oh, it's his first book. Give him no, a pass. I think you notice more. You just give him more passes. So I guess, yeah. I don't know what critical, maybe maybe that's a bad word to use. But I, I didn't notice as much because I didn't know it was his first book. If I knew it was his first book, I'd probably be keeping an eye out for like little literary things. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. But I did like the Hoyt part. Um, the whole frog comment is hilarious, and that's in the in the cover of yeah. one of the secret projects. I was so cool to like reread that again after having read like getting the Sunlit Man's box because yep. I was like, oh, it's from this book. I'm the like frog quote, yeah. Like I'd known I'd heard that somewhere, but I could not remember what book it was from. And then like I read it, it's like it's a Lantris. Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? And yeah, it all comes right back to Sunlit Man, which was the last secret project. 
Yeah. So it was his most recent book and his first book. Yeah, and he put so it the, in that box. So the most recent book in the box and the first book at the end. That's kind of cool. That is pretty awesome. Well, and then he has like that black Sion thing. It doesn't even look yeah. sound like a Sion. I don't think it is one. Yeah, who knows what that is. It's cool though. It's like one of those emperor's probe things from Star Wars that like hovers around like the black thing. <laughs> yeah. With like the little needle. <laughs> that's what it looks like. That's so. exactly what it is. Yeah, that's what it is. It's from Star Wars. <laughs> but I think it's time. It is time for our reviews. Okay. I think I want to go first on this one. Okay. Uh, Let's hear it. I'm going to start with my number and then I'm going to explain it. Okay. I gave Elantris a 9.1. <gasps> <laughs> what in the world? Yep. That is a huge rating. It is huge. It wow. Is huge. And I, I stand by it. It is one of your favorite Brandon it's Sanderson my, books? It's one of my favorite. You asked me if I would recommend this to someone as their first book, and I absolutely would. Wow. Yeah. That is a big rating. I really liked it. I How is that compared to bigger. your other books? Like, so Warbreaker, I gave an 8.3, I think. Yeah. This is almost a full point rating better than Warbreaker in my mind. Wow. Yep. That is crazy. So the nine, if you're new to the channel, first of all, subscribe, like the video if you enjoyed it, all the little things. But this is a select group of books that make it into the nine and above. Yeah. And I'll say it's a 9.1. Okay. It's not a 9.8, 9.9. Marty's given out tens here before in the past. <laughs> but You uh, gave a 10 for Words of Radiance, I think. I think I might have given it a 10. But it's a great book. It is a great book. <laughs> You'll have to watch that review too, I guess. Next, maybe. Yeah. But one of the things I thought, like, this is goes on the top shelf. It goes on the top shelf for me because the way the system is built, and even though it was his first book, like, that, that surprised me for sure. But there were enough conflicting stories that worked together in the end that I was like, that's exciting. It could have built itself up to like a nine four if it was just a little bit more, like there weren't as many like those little gaps where you're just like, ah, maybe a little stretch or that person's dialogue just doesn't really click well with their character. Little things like that brought it down to the lowest of the nines, but it was still like the, the majesty of the magic system they have was so cool. And the reveal was something I did not expect yeah, that was awesome. the The fact that it which the reveal problem the problem with Elantris yeah why okay, the magic yeah, yeah. wasn't working that reveal was so cool to me I was like it makes sense and it's not something that I feel like they pulled out of left field it was like this is why it worked and this is why it stopped working and these are the connections they had to make in order to bring it back again like it yeah. was it would never have repaired itself if they didn't intentionally make effort to figure out the problem like it wasn't going to resolve itself. So I liked that. I liked the effort they put into it. I liked the the fact that it's all based on intelligence and skill. Like he has to learn these things to be able to be a more a more skilled Elantrian. Um, that was cool. Magic system, definitely a big part of that. The other part was the fact that there were other hero characters that I think did just as good of a job and just as much important to the plot, like Sereni. Uh, they had a transformative character like Hraithan. All of these things, and for all of these reasons... <laughs> I gave it a 9.1 and I'm standing by it. Wow, that is pretty huge. Well, so you would be in that group of people that Sanderson says at the end that like that he has a lot of fans who say it's their favorite book. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. Not my all-time favorite, but I would, it's a 9. It's top shelf. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, did you listen to the the um, intro by Dan Wells at the very beginning? It was his, He's like, I have Sanderson's very first copy signed oh, copy man that's and cool yeah anyway he does all of the intentionally blank podcasts with sanderson now yeah. and everything but he kind of talks about he's like this is a story that we just love we cheered with the characters it was just fun we laughed and like all these things and your review sounds very similar to like like <laughs> what he had written you'll have I to think, listen honestly, to it i think i didn't read that but yeah. you'll have to listen have to, to it it is to super it. cool to hear just like how far sanderson has like come and like he just looks at it and he's like, I'm just very proud to have the very first copy of his very first published book signed by him. The, yeah, I cannot that's imagine be how worth much an is. insane amount <laughs> that's of money. What he like, says. I'm like, absolutely that's, insane. Can you imagine? But yeah, so, it's it's one of those things like I maybe I'm a bad reader, but I almost always skip the acknowledgments. Yeah, yeah. And like the prefaces by other authors. I'm like, I, I don't need to read that. I'll <laughs> skip if he just starts rambling on names, but I love hearing all the work that goes into it, like all the consultants that he talked with and like yeah. it is fascinating like all that goes into that's it, cool I, I guess i would be more interested in that like after the book i'm like tell me the story yeah yeah like where did this come from <laughs> yeah. so i i will definitely be doing that with wind and truth even nick i will start with the i'm gonna devour wind and truth like that's obvious yeah I'm gonna give me nuts page one copyright information yeah read all it all it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right oh okay 
So my final review okay. on this one. You're going to have to do some math, Jaden, for oh, the average. Man. I know it. <laughs> You know what? I am going to give it a 7.3. No way! <laughs> no! For those of you following along at home, this is the largest gap that we've ever had. Yes. I was. Book. That's why I was oh, shocked oh, oh, oh. when you said that. A 7.3? Are you crazy? <laughs> Dude, this is so funny because uh, it's okay. We'll we'll cut it and we'll fix your rating. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was a nine. We don't do that here. <laughs> Just kidding. No. Seven point three. Yeah. I'll so do the math while you explain. The funny thing is, is that this um actually came up from a lower rating for the very first time that I read this book. So the first time I read this book, didn't as like as much. No way. It probably would have been a seven or less. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Again, I remember the Goodreads review that I wrote on this because I wrote down, I'm like, listen, like I have to, again, have to remind myself of like what I thought about the whole book, not just the Sander Lanch at the end because he always nails the Sander Lanch. <laughs> like, like, that but recency bias will get you. It is. I, but I just don't know if the first time I was reading it, if it was the person who is uh, narrating the book or if it was his writing style that was really throwing me for a loop. The whole time, I'm just like trying to imagine like, okay, these characters just sound like kind of annoying and I want to like, it's just taking me out of the story. Like kind of how I mean, you say with audiobooks. Sands, I know. <laughs> yeah, some strong opinions there. But it's it's just, I wish that there was more, like uh, maybe a better reader. But I also comes back to, I think it was Sanderson's earlier books. And I think that he just wasn't as good at showing you the story and he does a lot of telling you the story. And I wish you could get a little bit more character development. I I wish Serini was more Yasta. <laughs> I just think Yasta is a great character. I think yeah. he's got some great, strong female characters later in his like further like later in his writings that he's good at. I think Serini is his first try. It's like, but it feels like a very much so. But um, and then all the rest of the story, I think the magic system is interesting. That's why it brings it up. And I think that um, I do like the Aeondor and like how the city is the first Aeon that you have to draw. And uh, all of that stuff is very fascinating to me. Again, like I said, it was way better on the reread. Also, the whole faith crisis that Hraithan is having, super cool, super fascinating. Yeah. Diloph is horrifying. And like, he I don't know. He has a wide gamut of characters in this book. For yep. Sure. All of that part of the story I really loved. I think he was just a little bit more weak any time that Iodon appeared in the story <laughs> or um, or her father uh, from Teod. Um, can't remember his name. It's, oh, don't do that to me. I know, I know. Right I at the end. Yeah, it's uh, Eventio. That's, that's, I knew it had Teod in it. Like Teod, yeah. Eventio, anyways. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I give it a... So I think that, that if I remember correctly... That would land at an 8.2, which I think was our next chapter official rating for Warbreaker. Wow. Which is kind of funny because I kind of see those books about the same level to me. Isn't that interesting? Even though I did... Yeah, I think you gave them an 8.1. I did not an give 8 it an 8.1. I did not give it an 8. I promise you I did not give it I'm thinking of a different book then. Yeah, yeah. I, I it was in the 7s. Has, I do think this has a... I put, you're right. I put Warbreaker in the 7s as well. Yeah, yeah. But it is... I, this, I think, is a book that matches a rating from another book, but we were a lot closer last time. Like This is... But an 18, 1.8 swing, which is huge yeah. for this podcast. Nuts, so nuts. We're breaking new ground over here. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. It's great. Interesting. That's good to hear. I think it's interesting to see how different people devour different books. I guess the, the last thing I will say with it, too, is uh, I was thinking about this because I already started reading our next book, which we will need you to have, have to some guess. guess. If you haven't commented your guess, guess is in the comments. Throw it in there. Um, but even just starting the next book, there is a massive jump between Elantris and his later, later writings. He has just become so much better of a writer and it was Interesting. refreshing to like get to that and like, this is the Sanderson I know and love. Well, I'm excited to jump into it. Hopefully you jump into it with us. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to give it a like and definitely tune in as further videos come out. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and we'll see you in the next one.